हेलो ऑलमोस्ट अ हंड्रेड इयर्स अगो अ मैन सेड आज द राइट क्वेश्चन एंड द नेचर विल ओपन द डोर टू हर सीक्रेट्स गेस वॉट इट डिड नॉन अदर दैन नोबेल प्राइज विनर डॉक्टर सी वी रमन सेट दो वर्ड्स गुड मॉर्निंग ऑनरेबल गेस्ट एंड माई डियर फ्रेंड्स I am honored to have such an excellent opportunity to speak before you on National Science Day. On this day, every year we commemorate the contributions of Dr. C. V. Raman in the field of science. Today, we also celebrate everyone working towards bettering our society through science and technology. The main objective of National Science Day is to bring awareness among the general populace to the importance of science and technology in our daily lives. Every year, the day is celebrated with a particular theme. This year's theme is integrated approach in science and technology for sustainable future. The, uh, this, coupled with our institute's mantra of inventing and innovating in technology for humanity, makes us uniquely positioned to promote the use of science and technology to tackle the challenges faced by our country. This year, the physics department at IIT Hyderabad is organizing the National Science Day in association with the newly formed IITH Optical Student Chapter. For over a hundred years, Optica, formerly known as the Optical Society of America, has been the world's leading champion for optics and photonics. A student chapter of Optica at IIT Hyderabad is aimed at providing a platform for knowledge sharing and networking, and help build a vibrant ecosystem to promote discussions in the area of optics and photonics. I do not see a better day than the National Science Day to kickstart the workings of our chapter. We have fantastic talks and activities planned during the day. Along with cultural and musical events, with this in mind, I would like to hand over the mic to Dr. Vandana. Dr. Vandana is a faculty member at the Physics Department of IIT Hyderabad and is currently working in the broad area of ultrafast atomic and molecular dynamics. I request Vandana, ma'am, to kindly take over. Sorry, the face is not taken. Thank you. That's fine. That is okay. So, uh, very good morning to one and all present over here. So, I feel privileged to extend my warm welcome to all of you for the celebration of National Science Day. As we all know that we have gathered here today to celebrate the day. In addition to that, we are also gathered here to inaugurate our very first Optical Society student chapter. So, National Science Day, as already Saurabh has told, so is every year celebrated on February 28th. The day when Sir Chandrasekhar Venkat Rao Raman, Venkat Raman discovered the Raman effect, which is a, fin a molecular fingerprinting and a, a phenomena in spectroscopy. So C. V. Raman discovered the Raman effect in 1928 while working in laboratory of the Indian Association of Cultivation of Science, Kolkata, which helped him in winning the prestigious Nobel Prize in 1930. the ob the basic basic objective of celebrating national science day is to propagate the message of importance of science and application among the people in 1986 the national council of science and technology communication asked the government of india to declare uh, february before that it was not celebrated so the, so they requested to declare february 28 as national science day so the government accepted the offer and declared that the day as national science day so very first national science day was celebrated in on february 28 1987 every year there is a theme as sarab told for national science day decided by dst so the theme of national science day 2021 was future of sti the science technology and innovation so impacts on uh, on education skills and work the theme was chosen for raising public appreciation of scientific issues involved and the impact science has on education uh, skill and work this year the theme of national science day is integrated approach in science and technology for a sustainable future so to make this event and today's day a blessed let's invoke goddess saraswati by lighting the lamp of knowledge and wisdom for seeking the choices blessings for the same may i request our respected deans the dean of faculty professor v kanchana the dean of academics professor majumda the, the dean of r and d professor kuchi and uh, our respected uh, head of the department professor prempal and also professor renu john please come on the dais and light the lamp and inaugurate the event and also inaugurate the optical society of the student chapter
We also have Professor Tyagrajan here with us, and I also, so he is a very renowned scientist in optics. So please welcome him here. So, sir. Thank you. I cordially invite the, the Dean, of Fac Dean of Faculty, Professor V. Kansana, to say a few words and welcome the guest. Thank you, Andana. Respected guests, deans, professors, colleagues, and my dear students, a very good morning to one and all. And I take this opportunity to welcome you all for the National Science Day celebration jointly organized by Department of Physics and IITH Optica student chapter. This is an auspicious occasion for all the researchers and the theme of this year's National Science Day is integrated approach in science and technology for a sustainable future. So we do have lots of scientific breakthroughs and transformation of such breakthroughs to technologies might lead to sustainable development, but with wise stewardship. Research as well as scientific and technical innovations will be very critical for any meaningful achievement. Still, the great challenge would be to use such a technology in a wise way that it balances advances in productivity with long-term source resource viability. Today's world is full of innovations and the COVID-19 pandemic has revealed the importance of science and technology for the well-being of global populations. And advances in these fields are necessary not only to recover better from the crisis, but also to address many other global challenges. So the hunt for the scientific innovations and translational research continues and we look forward for better technologies to emerge out from all the budding researchers of IITH, which certainly would project IITH in a very unique way. So with these few words, I welcome you all again for this event and hope you will enjoy the lectures and have a nice day. I would now like to invite the Dean of Academics, Professor Majumda, to say a few words and encourage our students with your words. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Pandana. Uh, good morning to all, uh, all uh, guests, all students, and my colleagues uh, of IITH and outside. Uh, so, so, welcome all of you for uh, this uh, auspicious occasion for Science Day for Indian Science and Technology altogether. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, this, uh, if you just go back this around 100 years, uh, what was happening exactly in uh, Calcutta? It's around uh, this Calcutta University and cultivation of science. That time, there are a group of administrators and uh, a group of uh, uh, very motivating professors and uh, a group of young researchers. So these are the team and with the cause. The cause was India was not independent that time. And Britishers are not funding Indian research, if you see. That time, that administrator's name is Ashutosh Mukherjee. If I tell you, nobody may, may not be recognizing him. But if I tell he's the father of the uh, uh, BJP and Jansang's uh, uh, founder, Sama Prasad Mukherjee, then probably you'll be able to understand that he's the father of uh, Sama Prasad Mukherjee. So he was the vice chancellor of that time. And around him, he, he asked money for from Tata groups, builder groups, because they know that the British government will not fund anymore for Indian scientists. So that was the things. Who are the professors? Professor J.C. Bose, Acharya uh, P.C. Ray. These are the kind of people who are motivating. And who are the neon researchers? It was Professor C.V. Raman, Professor S.N. Bose, Professor Benghat Shah, and the legacy continued with Prasant Chandra Mahalan Bish, the founder figure of ISI, uh, that uh, in the Statistical Institute, and then Amartya Sen. So these are the legacy. So think about that is a group of people that they came together. They all were together. They are doing their work, and with a, with a particular cause. And that kind of environment makes science what India today. I don't think any IIT, any other institution made such kind of popular uh, breakthrough science where every uh, uh, one of us throughout the world understands their contributions. Everybody knows Boson. Everybody knows Raman effect. So this is the kind of thing. So we need to replicate this situation. We need to replicate these situations. Taking mobile phone or um, laptop as a friend is not a right thing. You have to take it, make a group of people. Like they, these three people, SN Bose, CV Raman, and uh, Mignat Shah, they were friends. They discussed together. You just, even today, if you open the book from, from where I learned 
hit, hit transfer is a book of Meghnath Shah. He, he created his own hit. You see the first, after two page, the preface is written by Professor C. V. Raman. This is the kind of friendship. This is the kind of togetherness. This is the kind of discussing and celebrating science every time. And I feel that this is the time has come that our infinite consciousness, what we have, should not be limited in the mobile. We should have friends. We should have discussions. We should have a blue sky research. And we should ask fundamental questions to celebrate science every day. And let me be very frank. There is a plenty of room, not in the, not at the bottom, but everywhere. So let us think that we should do something. We should be excited to get the things. And it is really something new. We have these things inside us. Meaning of education is nothing but unfolding, unfolding that consciousness within us. So we have everything. We have to unfold it. That is the meaning of education. So let us celebrate again. Let us celebrate the excitement together. All of us are students. Okay, we are different parts of the journey. I am also learning every, every time I learn. Every time you learn, so we, let us celebrate together. Let us do something great and let us again replicate what our these people like Professor C.V. Raman, they have given for, for uh, uh, 100 years back. Let us celebrate. Thank you very much. So I now cordially invite the Dean of R&D, uh, Professor Kuchi, and enlighten our students with your words. Thank you. I was just chatting with uh, Professor Vandana. Uh, I was asking her what was her strength. Uh, she used to have a cabin next to me in ODF. Uh, she was saying she was the seventh faculty in physics and we had 20 students. And I was shocked today to learn that we have 200 students, a tenfold increase in 10 years. I think it's a remarkable uh, positive momentum for the Department of Physics. So. So I'm very happy that you have 20 faculty and 200 students, and I would like to see uh, 40 faculty and 2,000 students. That may be difficult, but at least 400 students. <laughs> so because our projected strength is 5,000 students yeah. in the next in the next three years. So congratulations to the uh, successive HODs and the Department of Physics for a fabulous job, you now putting together such a substantial team. Um, uh, uh, you know, I would like to. Uh, you know, we have in our in, uh, you know, in our culture remembering our ancestors. So today on the National Science Day, I think we should remember our Indian ancestors and the global ancestors. Um, so during pandemic, uh, I was reading the biographies of uh, my ancestors because I belong to the Department of Electric. So I read uh, the biographies of many scientists. Uh, it's really fascinated me um, that Faraday didn't have a college degree or a school degree. Uh, and uh, electromagnetism, is, magnetism and electromagnetic waves and wave propagation is my bread and butter. I work on wireless communications. So it just I read I read his biography twice, by the way. <laughs> it's just two different books, short books. If these are all free books available. You know, you can Google them. Then uh, Maxwell picked it up and wrote the, the equations in one go. And, uh, and I'm sure you would have all studied Maxwell's equations. And uh, that's again our bread and butter to design the antennas in my lab. I mean, that's what we live with uh, electrical engineers. Uh, so then uh, recently, I don't know how many of you um, uh, know, uh, IEEE, the institution of you know, electronics and electrical engineers, electrical electronics engineers, has recognized uh, J.C. Bose as the uh, inventor of, uh, or rather, discoverer of uh, millimeter waves. Um, I was just uh, googling, and I found an article with all the equipment that J.C. Bose had used in 1897, more than 100 years ago. Uh, I think uh, you know. It, uh, Wireless communications uh, engineers, rather, um, uh, IEEE uh, has uh, given the due credit to him, uh, which is a very, 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 you know, startling thing. And uh, I don't know, some of you may have heard about 5G. Uh, 5G mobile communications uses something called millimeter waves, uh, because you know radio spectrum is uh, is very crowded. So we all use our phones in, you know, 
800 megahertz and uh, up to you know two gigahertz range, but there's no more spectrum. So uh, people have moved to you know millimeter wave frequency range, and that's when suddenly people realize there is somebody for JC books, and uh, and a you know, remarkable piece of work uh, sitting in Calcutta. Uh, he built all the equipment himself and demonstrated it. Uh, pictures are available. Please look them up. Uh, so I would hope that our Department of Physics producers, people of uh, that caliber and young people should aspire to do that kind of research, uh, you know, discover the laws of nature and how the world works. Thank you. So uh, if uh, Professor Tyagarajan is still with us, can you, uh, it, it would be nice to hear you and encourage our students with your uh, warm words, please. Thank you. A very good morning to all of you. I would have loved to be physically present at IIT Hyderabad, but uh, uh, looking at the current situation, I'm still based in Delhi. I'm indeed very happy to learn that um, the physics department at IIT Hyderabad has started a student chapter of Optica. I'm sure uh, with the uh, joining of the faculty and students working in the area of optics and photonics, they'll be able to produce some outstanding work and uh, improve our knowledge in the areas of optics and photonics. Uh, I will be shortly giving a talk, but uh, uh, this day is a very, very important day for all of us, National Science Day. And uh, we must remember that uh, science is the foundation of technology or engineering and technology. And uh, as faculty and as students, we need to understand the foundations, the basics, to be able to apply, to be able to uh, solve problems, to be able to innovate. And so as a, as a part of educational system, we all have to have the uh, necessity for, for understanding the foundations of physics and, and sciences in general. And uh, today being the National Science Day, I wish all of you the best uh, in your careers, the students especially, uh, whether you are working in optics or photonics or any other field. And uh, uh, my, my good wishes to the student chapter of Optica at IIT Hyderabad. Thank you very much. So, uh, so, so the picture behind you looks exactly the same as you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I now likely I now kindly request our head of the department, Professor Premal, for a vote of thanks. Good morning, everyone. It is a great honor and privilege to pose the vote of thanks on this special day on the behalf of organizing committee and audience. I would like to give my party vote of thanks to our distinguished speaker, Professor Tyagrajan, for accepting our invitation. And uh, as I graduated from IIT Delhi, so I know you sir, very well. So you are a wonderful teacher, researcher, and human being. And uh, I thanks uh, our Dean faculty, Professor Kanchana, and Dean Academic, Professor Saptarsi, and Dean R&D, Professor Kiran, and our Dr. Renu John, who is here time from their busy schedule to grace this occasion. And I specifically thanks the student volunteers and organizing committee who are the big backbone of the seminar and uh, Last but not the least, I thank all the participants who are attending this seminar. And we will have four seminar special talk today. First one by Professor Tyagrajan, two special talk after the tea break, and uh, final talk at 4 p.m. So I request all of you to attend all the talks. You will be greatly benefited. Thank you very much.
Uh, I would now like to invite Professor Renu John if, to say a few words. Sir. Please, sir. It would be nice to encourage you. Sir. Good morning, all of you. Good morning, Professor Tangratin. It's great to see you. Good morning. Uh, I think uh, this is the first meeting of the Optica student chapter here, right? Mm -hmm. So how many how many members do we have? Forty eight. Yeah, that's a twenty eight. Okay, that's a that's a great number. I think we need to bring in uh, other colleagues and other faculty also working in optics and the students also to this uh, occasion. So, uh, uh, without much of introductions, I would like to uh, thank all the students uh, for being part of this uh, program and also wish you all the best for the National Science Day. Thank you. Thank you for this. Uh, now, uh, I would like to uh, invite my students here so to present OK to our guests. Thank you. So, uh, without any further delay, I would like to begin uh, with the scheduled events of the day. So, for that, I would now hand over the stage to uh, Mr. Uh, sorry. Thank you. Katie came ten minutes before. I'm ninety years old. Hello. Uh, I thank all the deans and professors for their kind and insightful words. Uh, let us now begin with the technical session scheduled for today. Uh, I would like to invite Professor Renu John to chair the first session. Professor Renu John is a professor at the uh, Biomedical Engineering Department of IIT Hyderabad and has a broad research interest ranging from biomedical imaging, digital holography, and nanomaterial-based mi microfluidic sensors. I, I would like to request Renu John, sir, to kindly take over the session. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. So I think uh, we will right away start with our technical sessions. We have our first speaker, uh, Professor Tiagrajan. Uh, so uh, he will be sharing the screen from there, right? Yeah. 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 So uh, let me just introduce uh, Professor Tiagrajan. So it's it's really my right to uh, introduce Professor Tiagrajan. He's one of the most dynamic professors we have ever seen at IIT Delhi. So uh, he uh, he completed his tenure at IIT Delhi in 2017 and moved in as a professor and head of department at uh, uh, Department of Physics and in the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences at uh, Bennett University, Great Noida. Uh, he was also the officiating director of IIT Delhi uh, from uh, Jan to April in 2016. He has several uh, visiting positions in various universities, various institutions in France. Uh, USA, Canada, Hong Kong, and Japan. He has published more than 160 research papers in the area of optics and photonics in international journals. And in fact, all of you know that you know he is the author of the great books in optics, uh, the optics, fiber optics, uh, optoelectronics. And you know, no student might have come to this stage without seeing these books. And it is one of the books we we are really proud to see that you know these books are the textbooks in all international universities. So uh, he has been. Uh, he has won several awards, including the Fiber Optic Person of the Year, 1987, by Lucent Technologies, Phenolex, 
and voice and data india fellow of the optical society of america fellow of the indian national academy of engineers in 2003 he was decorated with the title of uh, officier de l'ordre de Parme academy uh, uh, by the french government he received the teaching excellence award at iit Delhi in 2011 in 2016, he received the Mahatma Hansraj Gaurav Samman from his alma mater, Hansraj College, University of Delhi. He's a member of the governing body of IHUB, Quantum Technology Foundation at ISAR Pune, and he's the co-chair of the Task Force on Advanced Optical Communication from the Department of Telecommunication, Government of India, and member of the Council of International Science uh, Scientific Board of uh, Center for uh, Optical, Quantum Optical Technologies at University of Warsaw, Poland. Uh, his video lectures, studio courses on electromagnetics for class uh, 12 students under IIT pile and quantum electronics for the final year. Undergraduate and graduate students are also available online. His current research includes our, our research interest in the field of uh, guided wave quantum optics and nonlinear optical effects. Uh, Professor Tia Grazer, uh, please stay here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Renu, for the warm introduction. Uh, thank you to Nityanandan for having invited me for this talk. I'll share my screen. Is my screen visible? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, let me uh, close. Uh... Yes, sir. Okay. Let me put it here. Okay, uh, a very good morning to all of you. As I said, this is a very important day for science, um, being the day for the in which Professor C. B. Raman invented, discovered. Raman effect. And today I thought I will uh, give a talk on a very generic topic, which is optics and mechanics, a symbiotic relationship. Okay, so as has already been mentioned, February 28th is, is uh, celebrated as a uh, National Science Day in commemoration of the discovery of Raman effect. On this day, Sir C. B. Raman announced the discovery of the Raman effect, and for which he was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1930. And that's a photograph of the uh, quartz spectrograph that Sir C. B. Raman used to discover Raman effect. Just as a for completeness, I must mention that by age of 13, he had read Helmholtz's popular lectures on scientific subjects. He got a Bachelor of Arts degree at the age of 16 and MA from Chennai. He was first, first place and gold medalist. At the age of 18, he wrote the first scientific paper in the philosophical magazine, Unsymmetrical Diffraction Bands Due to Rectangular Aperture. Then he joined the Indian Finance Department in Calcutta, and then he resigned in 1917 and joined Indian Association for Cultivation of Science as college professor. He has contributed to multiple fields, among them acoustics, Musical instruments, light scattering, of course. He was elected to the Royal Society in 1924. And on February 28, 1928, he discovered, he observed this Raman effect, and for which he got the Nobel Prize in 1930. So here's the outline of my talk. A very brief history of optics, some interesting anecdotes which relate optics and mechanics, some examples. I hope I can give some entertainment in this lecture. Uh, then I will end by discussing two important aspects of Raman effect. One is applications in optical fiber communication, and the other one is in acoustic optic diffraction when Raman has contributed significantly. So the, the earliest uh, discovery or the laws of reflection was made by Euclid in 3 BC, and it was hero of Alexandria in the first century AD, when he stated that the law of reflection is a consequence of assuming that light, the path of length, path length is minimum. 
and this is the first occurrence of a minimum principle in mathematical physics. The attention then turned to refraction, and uh, a lot of people have contributed Ptolemy, Ibn Sal, Ibn Al Haytham, Johannes Kepler, Snell, and Descartes. All these people have done a lot of work right through the ages trying to understand the laws governing refraction, reflection, and light propagation itself. So Descartes actually uh, used his uh, understanding of particle nature of light. And uh, so at the refraction, he said that the tangential components of the velocity must be conserved as the particle enters from one medium to another medium. And using this, you obtain a relationship between the sine of the angles and you got a relation sine theta one by sine theta two, which was V2 by V1. Now it is known that the light bends towards normal when it enters from a rarer to a denser medium. And so according to this equation, the velocity of light, the speed of light in a, in a denser medium must be larger than the velocity of light in a rarer medium. That's coming from uh, this derivation, which Descartes had used for using particle or corpuscular nature of light. It was Pierre de Fermat who then looked at the solution, and in 1662, he proposed the correct path for both reflection and refraction is a path of minimum time. Fermat's results showed that light propagates slower in denser media, consistent with experimental measurements. So he didn't use a particle picture. He said that the path must be that which takes minimum time. In fact, the current modern statement of Fermat's principle is light beam follows stationary path. It could be a maximum, it could be a minimum, or it could be, it could not change to the first derivative. Of course, this leads to a following question. How does light know at the start of the journey which path will result in minimum time? And so this leads to some teleological issues and uh, Feynman's contribution in this in terms of path integral formulation is very interesting. So if you look at Fermat's principle, it says essentially that the time taken must be an extremum. So if you calculate, if you, if you take a light beam going from a point A to a point B along a certain curved path, this integral, which is the uh, time taken must be minimized and which because the velocity of light is constant C, this essentially implies that delta of this integral N ds must be zero. That's a variational principle, which is essentially to find a path from A to B for which this path is minimum, with an extremum. So if you apply Fermat's principle to refraction and calculate which is the uh, extremum time, you get the following result. The ratio of the signs is now V1 by V2. This is exactly opposite of Descartes' result. Descartes had a result of V2 by V1, and I get V1 by V2 here. So according to Fermat, light travels slower in denser medium as compared to a rarer medium. So this was all getting developed, and around this time, there was a challenge in mathematics. Let me go to some history. So the question is, who invented calculus? Was it Fermat? Was it Newton or Leibniz? Now, it so happens that Fermat almost invented the concept of derivatives in 1637 in his book called The Method. Five years before Newton was born and nine years before Leibniz was born. Fermat contributed to the development of calculus through his work on properties of curves, tangents, and so on. He founded areas bounded by these curves through a summation process, which is now called integral calculus. It's ironic that Fermat did not see what we now call as a fundamental theorem of calculus. In fact, Pierre Simon de Laplace, with another famous French scientist, said Fermat should be regarded as the true discoverer of differential calculus. Of course, Fermat's calculations are limited in scope with light, while Newton and Leibniz developed calculus to much more depth and breadth. So around mid 17th century, Isaac Newton and Wilhelm Wilhelm Leibniz independently discovered calculus. Both claimed that the other had stolen his work and the Leibniz-Newton calculus controversy continued until the end of their lives, unfortunate. At the same time, 
Newton wrote that his first, his early ideas about calculus came directly from Fermat's way of drawing tangents. And as this controversy was raging, to find out how much Newton really knew, Leibniz and Bernoulli discovered, devised the following test. It's called the bracket stockholm problem, and which was posed by Johann Bernoulli. The problem is, if you have two points at two different heights, and I want to make it slide for a child, for example, and assuming no friction, what should be the shape of the slide for which the, the child would take the minimum time to slide from A to B? Under gravity. The brachistochron is shortest and chron is time. Brachistos, brachistochron is, which is the, taking the shortest time. So this was, this was a challenge by Bernoulli. And what Bernoulli did was use a very simple analogy between mechanics and optics to solve the problem. Now we know that according to Fermat's principle, light takes a minimum time to propagate from one point to another. Now, if you apply, apply this uh, technique, you find that this, const, this quantity, the sign of the angle made by the, uh, di by the path of light at any, uh, at any point, divided by the velocity of speed or the speed of light at that point must be a constant. So Bernoulli said, if the above condition is the result of assuming minimum travel time, then starting from the above condition should result in the curve of minimum descent. What an amazing, uh, uh, what an amazing idea to, to relate something in mechanics to optics and optics and mechanics. So the, the problem is essentially there is a curve here along which the, if the, if the bead falls, you know that the, the speed of bead will increase as it falls down due to gravity. And we know the velocity of, or the speed of the, of the bead will be square root of 2GY at any point, keeping the uh, energy conservation. And so he said that imagine a medium in which the speed of light varies as square root of 2GY. G is a constant, 2 is a constant. So it must be, the speed must vary as square root of Y, the depth. Find the path of ray in such a medium. And the ray will follow the path of minimum time. And that the ray path must be the solution to the bracket stockholm problem. Amazing. Now here is a situation where you relate the two minimum principles in mechanics and optics and solve the problem in mechanics using optics. So if you simply uh, do a little bit of mathematics, you know that uh, you can calculate sine theta in terms of the uh, slopes dy by dx. And by simply putting this as a constant, sine theta by v must be a constant according to optics, and you get an equation for the curve. And this equation, the solutions are actually cycloids. So the minimum travel time, you can one can show that it is along the curve of a cycloid. So that's a linear curve, that's a parabola, that's a cycloid, and that's a circular path. You can see the different shapes. And Bernoulli was surprised that it's a cycloid. In fact, five solutions were obtained at that time. Newton, Jacob Bernoulli, brother of Bernoulli, Leibniz, de L'Hopital, in addition to Johann Bernoulli. So when the challenge was put up, Newton solved it overnight. He knew calculus. And Newton's solution was anonymously published in Philosophical Transactions of Royal Society in 1697. No name. Author's name did not exist. And Johann said, I recognize the lion by its paw. Brachistocker problem initiated the entire field of calculus of variations, which is a very, very important area in mathematical physics today. In fact, Brachistochron is used to design roller coasters, it's used to design the ski jumping slides, and also used to design the shape of the parachute, the chute that must come out of the airplane for people to descend as fast as they as fast as possible. What should be the shape of that chute that comes out of the uh, of the door so that the passengers can get out as quickly as possible? So Brachistochron has many important applications in uh, science and technology. Here I move to another very great mathematician, or the greatest mathematician, Leonard Euler, Swiss mathematician, and he's a student of Johann Bernoulli. Euler worked in multiple areas, geometry, infinitesimal calculus, trigonometry, algebra, number theory. And he developed the calculus of variations in 1732 
based on a problem given to him by Bernoulli. Incidentally, Euler is the only mathematician to have two numbers named after him, the Euler number U, E, and the Euler constant gamma. In 1730, he lost one eye. In 1771, he lost the other eye and became blind. And he was still publishing. Frobenius, another great mathematician, has said Euler lacked only one thing to make him a perfect genius. He failed to be incomprehensible. He wrote everything out in detail. Everything was comprehensible. He failed to be incomprehensible. He's very different from uh, Carl Frederick Gauss, who condensed everything into smaller and smaller derivations. In fact, the uh, magazine, The Mathematical Intelligencer, in 1990, had a uh, competition or had a wanted to find out which is the most clear, beautiful theorem in mathematics. And this is the equation, exponential i pi plus one is equal to zero. It's amazing there are two irrational numbers, e and pi. There's an imaginary number i here. There is a, this one plus and zero and equal. It's an amazing equation. And the second most beautiful theorem is this one, where if you take any regular polyhedron, calculate the number of vertices and the number of faces, it will always be equal to the number of edges plus two. Amazing equations. And Euler and Lagrange, as we will see, Lagrange is another great French mathematician, Joseph Louis Lagrange. At the age of 19, he communicated to Euler a general method of dealing with isoperimetrical problems, known as the calculus of variations. And Euler was also working in similar problems. Lagrange, young man, was also working in a similar problem. And Euler, which held his publication so that the young Lagrange might complete his investigations and claim the invention. What an amazing sacrifice by Euler to another young mathematician, Lagrange. Lagrange has contributed to multiple areas, calculus of variations, probabilities, differential equation solutions, orbit, number theory, and so on. And here we come to Euler-Lagrange equations. So Euler and Lagrange in the 1970s, 1750s they, uh, derived these equations. So the problem is you have to find a value, a curve y of x for which this is minimum. And this is a very standard problem in mechanics and now in optics. And this leads to the Euler-Lagrange equations. These equations are the foundations for the calculus of variations and Variational principle has applications in multiple branches of science, engineering, and technology, and medicine. And you can see these kinds of shapes of these soap films or the, the, the chain that is hanging, all decided by this calculus of variation principle. In 1744, Maupassius brought out the principle of least action, and it was originally formulated for geometrical optics and was later, later extended to mechanics. And said so the light does not, does neither take the shortest path nor the shortest time, but that for which the quantity of action is the least. And the action is mass times velocity times distance. And this was generalized by Hamilton. It's the principle of least action, as T is the kinetic energy and B is the potential energy. And that's the foundational equation for entire classical mechanics. I must mention that William Rowland Hamilton. I was an Irish mathematician, and he established geometrical optics as the mature mathematical science. In fact, we know Hamilton more through Hamilton's equation than mechanics and Hamiltonians in quantum mechanics and so on, but his initial work was all in optics. At the age of 22, while still an undergraduate, he was appointed Andrews Professor of Astronomy and Royal Astronomer of Ireland. And yes, studied geometrical optics, developed classical mechanics, dynamical methods, quaternions, neons, and many, many more. And interestingly, in 1824, only a 19-year-old Hamilton presented an early version of the theory of system of rays to the Royal Irish, Irish Academy, which lays the foundation for modern optics. And in 1833, he then adapted his optical techniques to dynamics. So actually, he developed 
optics before he pushed them into mechanics. At the age of three, he was reading English, was translating Greek, Hebrew at the age of five. He added German, French, Italian, Spanish by 12, and he had command on Syriac, Persian, Arabic, Sanskrit, and Hindustani. Amazing genius. So let me come down to optics now. So here is the Fermat's principle, which says that delta of the optical path length, this is optical path length actually connecting the point A and B, must be zero. So if you do a bit of mathematical um, change, you can write this equation in a slightly different form. And then this very much looks like principle released action, where now this is the Lagrangian. So I can define an, an optical Lagrangian in terms of refractive index and the derivatives of the transverse coordinates x and y with respect to z and get this equation. And in optics, in mechanics, this should have been delta of t1 to t2, l dt is equal to zero. So time gets replaced by distance z and the Lagrangian, uh, the, the mechanical Lagrangian is now the optical Lagrangian defined in terms of refractive index and uh, the derivatives dx by dz and dy by dz. And just like in mechanics, one can start from these equations, derive Lagrangian equations for x and y coordinates, and these two lead to the famous ray equation, which determines the path of rays in any inhomogeneous medium. Given any inhomogeneous medium, n is a function of x, y, z, all you have to do is to solve this equation to get the path of rays in this medium. So for example, if you are given a medium which refractive index depends only on one coordinate x, for example, you can uh, write this equation and get some uh, constants of motion, just like in mechanics, you get constants of motion of, uh, using the Grangian formulation. And that equation simply becomes a second order differential equation. Compare this with Newton's equation of motion, you have, instead of the time, you have the distance z here, Instead of mass, you have the uh, constant beta tilde, which is a constant here, this quantity. And instead of the refractive index, you have the potential. Very similar equations between Newton's equation of motion of particles and uh, the ray equation. And actually, this can help us to understand many of the ray trajectories uh, in inhomogeneous media. In fact, the formation of mirage, where you have a refractive index distributing as a function of height, above the surface, gives a ray path which are now curved, and gives me a sense of reflection, as if there's reflection. So you can see the rays which are actually curved because of propagation to what we call as graded index media or inhomogeneous media. So Lagrangian optics has many applications. One of them is in the area of optical fibers. Optical fibers, uh, Standard optical fibers are characterized by refractive index, which depends only on the cylindrical radial coordinate. It's independent of the azimuthal angle phi and the distance z along the fiber axis. And in, we can write the Lagrangian in the cylindrical polar coordinates in terms of r theta, r phi, and z. And if you note here, the Lagrangian is independent of z and phi. The moment you have an Lagrangian, which is independent of certain coordinates, you get some invariance. So you get two invariants of the ray. That means as the ray propagates, these two quantities will not change at all as the ray propagates. And by substituting this into the ray equation, you can get the path of rays in the medium. You can see here, this constant beta tilde, there's one constant L tilde here. And solution of this equation gives me the complete path of rays in any cylindrically symmetric refractive index profile optical fiber. And this leads to the concept of guided rays, refracting rays, leaky, leaky rays, and so on. Very interesting area of study in multimode optical fibers. One can use this Lagrangian formulation to study ray paths in um, spherically symmetric structures. For example, you have Maxwell's fisheye here, where all rays starting from one point will end up another point perfect imaging from one point to another point. Of course, you have depression effects, so these are geometrical optics pictures. You have Leonberg lens here, which makes rays emanating from one point all parallel. And the refractive index is slightly different profile. 
Incidentally, these are very interesting from the perspective of uh, uh, making parallel rays out of points or focusing parallel rays into a particular point. And uh, uh, here is a fabricated one by using femtosecond lasers in polymers. And uh, you can see the, uh, the kind of reflected profile and the, uh, the focus spot. Gives you, gives you the, the best focus, focusing possible at all. It's interesting to know that uh, such lenses exist in the animal kingdom. The eye of a jellyfish is a graded index lens, and that's the refractive index profile as a function of distance from the, uh, from the center. And this is producing almost aberration free imaging. So the nature has its own way of devising, modifying its own evolutionary processes to create refractive index profiles, which are used by the animal kingdom to maximize their vision. In classical mechanics, we go from Lagrangian to the Hamiltonian formulation. In a very similar manner, in optics, we can define optical momenta, the derivatives of the Lagrangians. And actually, in optics, these are the optical direction cosines of the rays. And once you define the optical momenta, you can define the optical Hamiltonian, exactly like what we have in classical mechanics, and we get an expression for optical Hamiltonian, which depends on the refractive index profile and the two momenta. And like in classical mechanics, one can derive Hamilton's equations of motion, dx by dz and dp by dz, this is a one-dimensional problem. And you can actually develop the entire field of Hamiltonian optics and Lagrangian optics. Very, very interesting area. And these are very powerful techniques because they are very generalized formulation of geometrical optics. Just like Hamiltonian formulation and Lagrangian formulations in classical mechanics are very general. Similarly, Lagrangian and Hamiltonian optical formulations are very powerful and generalized formulations. You can study, you can use this to study propagation through optical systems and studying aberrations. Hamilton actually introduced characteristic functions, which helps you in knowing, if you know the symmetries of our optical system, one can draw very general conclusions. So for example, what should be the shape of the surface separating two media that can focus all rays from one point to another point? What should be the shape of a surface that renders parallel after reflection all rays emanating from a point? So these are very general questions, and this can be very well explained using the Lagrangian and Hamiltonian formulations. In fact, this particular Hamiltonian formulation is currently being extensively used to design metamaterials or cloaking devices. So what is the refractive index profile I must choose such that light rays do not have access to certain defined regions? I don't want light rays to ever be present in this region. So what should be the refractive index profile that I must develop so that light rays are prohibited from entering these regions? Cloaking, very interesting area of work. Now, if you go a little deeper, you find that uh, just like classical mechanics to quantum mechanics relationship, as the de Broglie wavelength goes to zero, you go from quantum mechanics to classical mechanics. Similarly, you get geometrical optics from wave optics as you let the wavelength go to zero. And just like in quantum mechanics, I can define an X component of optical momentum as, so this is the momentum in classical mechanics, and I can define the momentum in optics, classical momentum. This is actually direction cosine, and lambda bar is like H bar, lambda by two pi, which is one by propagation constant. And I can actually quantize geometrical optics, just like I quantize classical mechanics to get quantum mechanics. I can quantize geometrical optics by making the Hamiltonian Newton operator, write down the Schrodinger equation in optics, exactly like quantum mechanics, substitute H operator here, do some manipulation and get the wave equation. So actually, wave equation is the quantized form of geometrical optics, just like quantum mechanics is the, geometric, is the quantized form of classical mechanics. 
very interesting analogies between these two fields, robotics and mechanics. And incidentally, so if you if you look at wave equation in optics, for example, a one-dimensional wave equation in a waveguide, and Schrodinger equation in a one-dimensional potential well, they are exactly the same. Refractive index profile here is nothing but potential distribution. The propagation constant and energy eigenfunctions are the analogs 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 here. The electric fields and the wave functions are analogs. And so these kind of analogies are very useful in transferring ideas among these two fields and have actually enriched both of them, both fields. Both optics and mechanics get enriched when you take ideas from one field and use it in another field. Uh, so there are many, many uh, uh, analogies, or I would like to present some which we have worked on between quantum mechanics and waveguides. So coupled mode equations in uh, coupled optical waveguide systems and the uh, atomic transitions in, quant in uh, molecular uh, atom, atom, photon, atom photon interactions are very similar. And there are two techniques, two particular techniques which are used. One is called simulated study by the Raman passage, uh, in which Raman process is used. And I will very briefly explain. So in atomic physics, if you have a three level system and uh, there is no transition allowed between the levels one and two, you can actually go via intermediate level three and populate level two. And the interesting fact is the population of level three always remains negligibly small. The atom actually, the, the, the atom actually transfers from one to three, one to two via three, but never populate into three. And it has a different counterintuitive uh, coupling process. It's called the stimulated adiabatic, stimulated adiabatic, uh, Raman adiabatic passage. Just like a three level system, I can have a three waveguide system here in which I can transfer light from one waveguide to the other waveguide through a very similar process of stira. The equations governing the three waveguides and the equations governing the three level systems are almost the same. And you have a set of equations which you solve, and you get very similar processes. For example, so I can transfer light from one waveguide to another waveguide through an intermediate waveguide without ever having light in the intermediate waveguide. So we have done some work with my graduate student, Prakati Ashna. Here is the uh, how the amplitude of the light in the waveguide one, in which I have launched light goes to zero, and the amplitude of waveguide three actually increases and almost never populating the level, the, the waveguide two in between. So it's very interesting because these such structures can be very robust to waveguide design parameters and uh, very similar, the process is very similar to STIRAP in atomic systems. We've also used this particular process to convert light between frequencies. So you start with the pump frequency here, use nonlinear interaction to double this frequency to second harmonic, and then immediately transfer that to two lower frequencies by difference frequency generation. So this is this is process of quasi phase matching in lithium niobate waveguides, and you can completely convert all the pump light into the pair of frequencies here. So this is a simulated plot of how the pump power varies as a function of distance, and the signal and idler power, the two frequencies omega i and omega s, increase as a function of distance. And you can see here the second harmonic field has a power which is 0.1 percent of the total power in the other field other fields. And that means very, very little field actually is pumped into second harmonic. Very interesting because you can perhaps use these processes where the medium is uh, has certain strange properties of the second harmonic field frequency, and you can avoid those effects by simply transferring light from omega p to this pair of frequencies through a cascaded process without populating the intermediate frequency. Another very interesting area is in uh, relating quantum mechanic uh, uh, states of light to light propagation, Gaussian beam propagation in optical waveguides. So I'll just very briefly uh, present some very interesting analogies. Actually, in quantum uh, quantum optics, you can discuss many, many different states of light. And here is, for example, a coherent state. Coherent state is the state which is closest to a classical laser beam. And as you increase the number of photons in a in a coherent state, the state becomes more and more classical. So here are about four photons in the class in the coherent state. There are average of 25 photons here, 
already the uh, the noise is decreasing 924 photons and you have almost a classical electromagnetic field if you compare this kind of a time variation with z variation of a gaussian beam propagating in a parabolic index medium you see very similar processes it's a gaussian beam propagating with the distance here you have the electromagnetic wave changing with time time variation here is distance variation you can actually relate even more uh, in terms of squeeze states this is there's a state called squeezed vacuum state which has noise levels which are much less than a uh, standard vacuum and as applications in uh, metrology interference in fact the laser interferometer gravitational observatory ligo uh, is planning to use squeezed vacuum to improve the sensitivity of the gravitational wave detection and as you can see here the uh, the intense the field actually is squeezing in between and if you look at a gaussian beam in a waveguide it also has the same similar procedure similar process propagation process and if you have a phase squeeze slide which is variation like this it's very similar to again a gaussian beam propagating in a parabolic index medium so these kinds of comparisons can help uh, in understanding what may be happening uh, in these uh, exotic states of light by comparing them with corresponding states in optics that you have uh, in waveguides so you have a very good analogy between gaussian beams in waveguides and quantum states of light Fermat's principle has inspired the entire Lagrangian and Hamiltonian formulations. It has inspired Schrodinger equations, quant quantum mechanics, inspired Feynman's form of quantum field theory and statistical mechanics. Analogies between optics and mechanics are enriching both fields. New ideas borrowed between the two fields help them coming up with new ideas and it's still a wide field to be discovered. It's expected that using these analogies, we can design new optical systems with very interesting properties. In fact, there's a lot of work going on in optical materials and transformation optics to study Hawking radiation, gravitational lensing, curved space time, black holes, etc. You have similar analog analogies in optics. Fiber optics has been extensively used to generate and explore complex nonlinear wave phenomena found in fluid flows, including turbulence, rogue waves, chaos, etc. Possibility of controlling light by curved space in nanophotonic structures, manipulating electron matter waves for electronic devices, and much, much more. There's a lot of open space, as the Dean was pointing out. There's a lot of possibilities exist by using some of these analogies to understand fields. So before I close my lecture, I would like to very briefly tell about two very important contributions of Raman and what uh, one of them which we have applied in optical fibers. So this is actually Raman scattering. Raman scattering takes place when you have an incident photon interacting with a molecule, uh, and the molecule jumps into the vibrational state and picks up some of the energy, and the scattered photon has lower energy. It's called the Stokes photon. If you shine a laser beam into an optical fiber, you get Raman scattered light coming out, and uh, it's silica essentially. So you have very broad spectrum. It's a an amorphous material here, so a very broad spectrum of Raman scattering. And the peak is shifted from the pump by about 13 terahertz. So if you have a 14, 15 nanometer pump, you have peak Raman scattering around 1500, 15, 15, 50 or so nanometers. So actually, this is currently being used for amplification of optical signals. So you have an optical fiber here, and you launch a pump light from the reverse direction. So as light propagates through the optical fiber, it gets attenuated. But when it interacts with the pump that is propagating in the reverse direction, it undergoes stimulated Raman scattering and gets amplified. And these are some measurements which we had carried out at IIT Delhi. As you can see here, you can get amplifications of a gain of 10 dB with a pump power of about 350 milliwatts. So you have um, significant amplification. The interesting thing to see is it has a very broad range of wavelengths you can amplify simultaneously, right from 1530 to 1570, which is the region of current C-band in optical fiber communication systems. So this is a fiber Raman amplifier. One problem which this has is that you have a gain which is varying with wavelength. Now, if you build an amplifier, you don't want an amplifier which uh, amplifies some wavelengths much more than the other. You would like to have a flat gain. 
and so we had done some work on this in which we had designed designed different kinds of fibers to achieve flat gain by using the following uh, uh, analysis for example if you have a raman spectrum the raman spectrum has a peak curve like this now the raman gain of optical fiber in its uh, formula also has an effective area how big is the mode in the fiber and by designing fibers you can actually design the effective area variation with wavelength to match the effective variation of the numerator with wavelength so you have gr varying with wavelength you have a effective varying with wavelength if you sort of compensate one by the other you can have a gamma r which is the raman gain scatter gain coefficient which is constant almost and here is a design you have essentially flat gain over a very broad wavelength region from 14a to 15 10 nanometer here this is for the s band of uh, communication system so you can actually design fibers with uh, flat raman gain we did some work also on um, uh, using tunneling loss tunneling of, of light from the core to an outer cladding to design ex essentially raman amplifiers with broad spectra uh, the 20 db gain so there are two kinds of raman amplifiers one is discrete raman amplifier just like an erbium doped fiber amplifier the other one is a distributed raman fiber amplifier which is a which uses the amplification of the communicating fiber itself to uh, to amplify the signals the other area in which uh, raman and uh, raman contributed significantly is the post optic refraction so when you launch a sound wave in a medium you generate strain it could be acoustic it could be longitudinal strain it could be tensile strain this strain leads to refractive index variation and as light propagates as the sound wave propagates this strain waves also propagate and refractive index modulation can lead to diffraction of light so if you have an acoustic wave propagating in a medium and if you shine a light wave from here this acts like a diffraction grating and gives diffraction orders now if this if this wavelength of sound is large compared to the uh, to some some parameters here which we call the ramanath regime you find multiple orders of diffraction in fact uh, people experimented at that time and found that the the intensities of various orders were changing so what looked like arbitrary variations in amplitudes as we change the strength of the acoustic wave it was raman and narendra nath who developed an analysis in 1935 and got an equation describing the amplitude of the nth order as an equation differential equation and if you look at this equation this is exactly the the current equation for bessel functions so they got solutions in terms of bessel functions of these various orders and this particular technique uh, or of diffraction is called raman nath diffraction and they gave a complete math mathematical analysis for this diffraction process so i'd like to end my talk here uh, sir c v raman was a great teacher and researcher by his own example he made students realize the importance of endurance hard work and steadiness the optica optical society of america made, mentions raman's participation in the training of more than 500 indian scientists constitutes one of the one of his most enduring and far reaching accomplishments for which not only india but the whole world should be everlastingly grateful A final quote by Raman: "Intellectual beauty is indeed the highest kind of beauty. Science, in other words, is a fusion of man, man's aesthetic and intellectual functions devoted to the representation of nature. It is therefore the highest form of creative art. Science is the foundation of engineering and technology. Doing science is also an art. And thank you very much for your patient listening. And I would be very happy to." any questions that any of you may have uh, thank you very much sir for the wonderful and insightful talk uh, now we'd like to open the floor for questions from the audience i uh, stop sharing uh, once a second here yeah. oh sure sir uh, where do i stop uh okay uh, uh i have a question for you sir uh, actually yeah, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. more of a fundamental 
Uh, One second, what happened to my screen? Uh, open Webex. Just a second, I got I lost I got, I got disconnected. Can you see me? Uh, we, uh, yes, sir, we can see you. Where am I? Uh, 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 from... How do I make my screen big? Uh, so bottom right. Yeah, but if I do here. Uh... Yeah, any question? Please ask me a question. I'm trying to. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I have a question for you. Uh, yeah. You mentioned uh, nanophotonic devices like photonic crystals and metamaterials. Uh, we know that like in metamaterials, we use the generalized Snell's law where we have like uh, if we have meta surfaces, then we can have momentum matching conditions. And then we can transform any incident wave to any uh, angular reflected wave. Uh, I, my question is, uh, to what extent can the transformation happen? Like, can any incident angle can be transformed into any refracted, uh, reflected angle, or is there any limits? You see, you have to you have to satisfy certain conservation laws. Uh, as long as you satisfy those conservation laws, you should have no problem. But uh, you cannot break those laws. Uh, and you see, when you even look at refraction from a isotropic to an anisotropic medium. For example, I can have a situation where light is incident normally on an anisotropic interface and refracts at an angle. Yes. Sir. Now, if you look at Snell's law from the point of view of rays, this seems to be incorrect. But you have to look at Snell's law with the momentum, k vector of the light waves, incident light wave and the refracted light waves. Of the refracted light waves. So, looked at from the propagation vector point of view, there is no problem. Snell's law is still valid at the uh, isotropic and isotropic interfaces. So, as long as you are able to satisfy conditional or conservation of transverse uh, or propagation constant, etc., I don't see any problem at all. But it might need media of uh, complex refractive indices, for example, negative refractive index or zero refractive index or something like that. Yes. So then the problem arises. So even in the uh, cloaking, you need media which are not normally found in nature. Yes. sir. Yeah. So then you have to use nanophotonic structures to make artificial media. Yes. sir. So you have uh, regions of small refractive indices. So you see light wave is a very long wave. So it's about 500 nanometers, 500, 600 nanometer. If yes. you're nanophotonic structures have dimensions of tens of nanometers, the light wave doesn't see the, it sees a bulk medium. Yeah, it and then you can control yeah. the refractive index of that medium by appropriate nanophotonic structures. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, sir. Yes, yeah. sir. Thank, thank you, sir. Uh, and audience, anybody else has any other questions? Okay. Uh, thank you very much, sir, again, and I would like the audience to give a big round of applause again for this delightful talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. All the best to all of you. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, now, uh, I request everyone uh, will break for tea. Uh, then we can join back our, uh, and assemble here around 11 o'clock again. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we can yes no, thank you thank you sir thank you so much <clears throat>